Moral intuitions and emotions, some evidence. If you remember, we're asking this rather complicated question. What do adult humans compute that enables their moral intuitions to track moral attributes such as wrongness? Very tricky question. But the question's made simpler for us by the availability of an interesting hypothesis. The hypothesis is that humans rely on what Sinnott Armstrong and colleagues call the effect heuristic. Where encountering or thinking about an act makes you feel bad, judge that it's morally wrong. That's where those moral intuitions come from. So the idea is that what we're computing is how we feel. What we're tracking is the rightness or wrongness of the act. As long as our emotions track rightness or wrongness within limits, our moral intuitions will be good within limits. Marvellous, very simple idea. But what we need is some evidence for this. And in order to get some evidence, we need to derive a prediction. And the prediction here is very simple. If you make people feel bad without them realising it, then they ought to attribute that bad feeling that they have to the reaction they have to an action or th to thinking about an action. And so they should be more inclined to think that the action is morally wrong. Complicated idea, I'll say it again. Here's the prediction. If you make people feel bad without them realising that you've made them feel bad, they might be likely to attribute the badness they feel to them thinking or encountering an action and therefore be more likely to judge that that action is morally wrong. So the prediction. And of course that should work in just the same way if you make people feel particularly good without them realising it. So here's our prediction. Now before we go any further, I want to stress the importance of the intervention that we're offering in the prediction. You see, there's a lot of research about emotions and moral intuitions, which really just looks at correlations. But correlations are not actually that useful. Consider that there are two different causal models here. One causal model, this is the effectoristic causal model. The emotion is a cause of the unreflective judgment, which is the moral intuition. But there's a different causal model, which says, look, when you make an ethical judgment and you judge that an action is bad, that causes you to feel worse. So the two things are correlated. Now, the first causal model is compatible with our hypothesis. The second causal model is not compatible with our hypothesis. That's compatible with the negation of our hypothesis, in fact. So if we want to test our hypothesis, we need to distinguish between the two causal models. And we can't do that by looking at correlations between moral judgments and emotions. After all, we can get correlations without emotions causing judgments. That's why the intervention is crucial. What we're suggesting is that you intervene on the way that somebody feels, change the way they feel, and see how that affects their judgment. That's entirely different from intervening on their emotion in a world in which the judgment causes the emotion. See, if, if the first causal model is right, the intervention on the emotion should make a difference to the judgment. If the second causal model is right, the intervention on the emotion should not make a difference to the judgment. See how that works? So it's very important that what we're looking at here is not evidence that judgments and emotions are somehow correlated. What we're looking for is this, change the emotion and there is an effect on the judgment. That, making people feel bad, is what's going to provide evidence for our hypothesis. Good, OK, so we understand the logic of our prediction. Um, is it supported by evidence? Well, the work that I want to draw your attention to here is some old research from 2008 by Schnell and colleagues. They conducted a number of experiments. One of their experiments, which is actually simplest to understand, um, they had participants in one of two conditions. In one condition, they were sitting at a clean, tidy desk in a lovely environment, and they were asked to make some judgments about various uh, vignettes describing actions and how morally blameworthy they felt the protagonists were in each case. The other group got exactly the same vignettes, um, but they sat at a really disgustingly dirty desk. So it was kind of sticky. Uh, they had some d disgusting, dirty tissues around and some empty, I think, empty pizza boxes. I'm not sure. But the whole environment was really disgust inducing. So that's one of the experiments that they did. Kind of relatively simple, easy to understand, but not brilliantly controlled. I therefore want to draw your attention to their fourth experiment. 
because I think the fourth experiment is the most revelatory of the things that they have done. It's harder to understand, but it's worthwhile putting the effort in here because it actually provides us with a better picture about the correctness of the prediction. So here we've got three groups um, and each group is going to see a video clip. In one group, uh, they see a video clip from the film Train Spotting. I'll show you the video clip later in these lectures, uh, which is designed to induce disgust. So this is the famous toilet scene from uh, Train Spotting, a particular favourite of mine, uh, where somebody has to use the worst toilet in Scotland and then actually to, to reach into this disgusting toilet in order to receive you'll see what happens actually. Uh, it's pretty horrible, it's pretty horrible. Uh, it's very likely that people watching that would have certain feelings of disgust. Uh, another video clip was used to induce uh, sadness, so a very sad scene. Um, and then you can have a third video clip which is just neutral. So you've got three three groups here. And the idea is that the each group, what, what changes is which video they see and therefore hopefully which emotion they're feeling. But after that everything is the same. So they each get the same vignettes and make the same judgments. Then they've got various vignettes, and in each case the, partic the participants have to judge how wrong the action is. Is it terribly wrong or is it more or less okay? Now interestingly, among those vignettes, half of them involve actions which are themselves quite disgusting. Um, so they're supposed to be, in some sense, morally relevant actions which are disgusting. So for example, uh, eating a dead dog, uh, having a debate about whether to engage in cannibalism, that kind of thing. So both morally relevant and disgusting. The other half of the vignettes are not supposed to be disgusting, but they're still morally relevant. So for example, um, uh, lying about your, your CV or finding a wallet in the street and not handing it to anybody, just taking the cash for yourself and so on. Uh, so we've got some actions which are morally relevant and disgusting to judge and some actions which are morally relevant and not disgusting. So what were their predictions? Steve, that's a, that's a great question, actually. You know what, I'm going to ask you that question. Uh, what were their predictions? With your lecture buddy, with your partner, just take 90 seconds and try to work out for me, please. What were the predictions that these authors made? 90 seconds, go. Okay, so hopefully you had a good crack at what their predictions are, a good guess at that. Um, here's what they actually predicted from the paper. First of all, they predicted that disgust but not sadness would influence moral judgments. And secondly, they predicted that that would be the case both for the vignettes involving the disgusting and wrong actions and also for the vignettes involving the non-disgusting but wrong actions. So it shouldn't matter whether the action that you're judging is finding a wallet in the street and not handing it over, keeping it for yourself, or thinking about uh, cannibalism, being tempted to eat somebody. Um, in both cases, you're, you should be equally influenced by whether or not you feel disgusted antecedently. <clears throat> uh, so that, that, that's the main prediction here. But there is a complication. There's no way you could have known this uh, so what I hope is that you got this, that you managed to suggest that this is the right prediction here, that disgust 
but not sadness makes a difference to the judgment, but it does so irrespective of whether the action being judged is itself disgusting. The complication that you couldn't have got is uh, the private body consciousness issue. So what Schnall and colleagues did was divide, I don't know why they did this, and they don't really explain why, but they divided their participants into two groups. Uh, those who had high private body consciousness, which is roughly speaking, awareness of your own body, and those who had low private body consciousness, so that were less aware of their own body. What they reasoned was this, that those who have high private body consciousness will be more affected by the disgusting video, whereas those who have low private body consciousness probably will be largely unaffected by the video, and so the effect for them will be less strong. So their idea, I think, is this, that, that it's only really when you've got high private body consciousness that you be, could be confident that the manipulation inducing disgust or sadness and so on will actually have an effect on how the participants feel. Seems reasonable, seems reasonable, um, but it is a complication. All right, good. <clears throat> so their results in a nutshell are that disgust influence moral judgments similarly for both disgust and non-disgust vignettes. So in a nutshell, the predictions were confirmed. Many people are going to switch off at this point, but let's go a little bit deeper. Let's go just a tiny bit deeper. Um, here are the people with high private body consciousness. And what you can see looking at the graph, just for illustration, is that those who encounter disgust are regarding the actions as more wrong, and indeed quite significantly more wrong, as those who encountered sadness or those who encountered the neutral video to start with. So remember that these are three different groups of participants and they're making judgments about the same vignettes. But the people who had the disgust video and a high private body consciousness, so more aware of their own bodies, roughly speaking, they are more severe, more harsh in their judgments about moral wrongness than people who had sadness or the neutral thing. So that's what you'd expect from the prediction. And the graph illustrates this quite nicely. The conclusion, of course, depends on the statistical analysis rather than uh, the graph. The graph's just providing for us the illustration. What you can see in the case of the low private body consciousness over here is that the, oh, sorry, I'm losing myself. Um, if you look at that left column there, that's the disgust column, compared to the far right column, the neutral column, they're pretty similar. And statistically, that's the same thing. So in the low private body consciousness, the disgust manipulation isn't having an effect. So here we've looked slightly more detail at the results. And we've seen that what their results show is not simply that disgust makes an effect. What they've shown is that when you have high private body consciousness, then disgust could make an effect to your ethical judgments. So let's look at these conclusions. Uh, sorry, before we do that, um, let me just note that the heuristic that we're testing, the hypothesis that we're testing, is really a hypothesis about feeling bad. Schnall et al are looking specifically at disgust. So there is kind of a mismatch here that we ought to be careful about. While we're being careful about the data, we should also be careful about how we're using it. Uh, so we don't want to assume that disgust and feeling bad are just one and the same one and the same thing. Although there may be some background theoretical reasons to think that actually in the ethical case, disgust is a kind of emotion which is specifically linked to morality. And so the kind of feeling bad that ought to influence moral intuitions. Now I'm not saying that's right, I'm not saying that's wrong, I'm just saying we need to be careful around this. So what did Schnell et al write in their conclusions? So first of all, the effect of disgust applies regardless of whether the action to be judged is itself disgusting. If you're judging attempted cannibalism, that's disgusting and bad, or you're judging somebody who is uh, faking their resume, just lying about their qualifications on their resume, um, it's not a disgusting action, but it's a bad action. If you're antecedently feeling disgusted, you're harsher about the person faking the resume, just as you're harsher about the person thinking about eating people. Secondly, the disgust influenced moral, but not additional non-moral judgments. I haven't mentioned this yet, um, but the Schnell and colleagues, they're very careful. So what they did was they also gave their participants a series of vignettes about various uh, legal matters, uh, political matters to make judgments on. So for example, you know, should there be more or less funding for um, keeping illegal immigrants out of a particular country? And they noticed that the disgust had no effect on these non-moral judgments. Right? I guess all judgments are in some way moral. Uh, so strictly speaking, we would say these are uh, 
less obviously <laughs> judgments where ethical principles are going to apply. But those, uh, the important thing here is that they got a difference. So they didn't see an effect of the disgust on the more political compared to the more obviously ethical judgments. Third finding, because the effect occurred most strongly for people who were sensitive to their own bodily cues, it appears that the results are really about the feelings and not just being primed to you know, think about disgust, right? It's not a matter of the concept or about thinking. Um, so that helps us to understand why the private body consciousness distinction could be, could be important. Presumably, both people with high and low body consciousness are thinking just as much about disgust. They've just seen something incredibly disgusting in narrative form. But the people with high body consciousness are actually feeling more so it looks like the feelings are driving the result and not the thoughts about disgustingness. And the last point is that it's not any old emotion that does the work here. So inducing sadness didn't have similar effects. If anything, the trend was in the opposite direction, that people were less, less harsh in making ethical judgments when they were feeling sad. Very good. So those are the conclusions that Schnell and colleagues themselves present of their work. Our question, though, is whether the prediction is confirmed. What prediction? I knew you were going to ask that. I'm, I'm well prepared here. Um, the prediction was this. If you make people feel bad without them realising it, they'll be more inclined to judge that something is morally wrong. Is that prediction confirmed by the experiment Schnell et al. experiment 4 that we have just been discussing? With your lecture buddy, 90 seconds. Is the prediction confirmed? Go. Based on discussion with other audiences, I expect there would be a diversity of opinions about whether the prediction is confirmed. The complication, I think, is the issue about private body consciousness. See, we got significant effects of disgust only in the cases where there was high private body consciousness, not in cases where there was low private body consciousness. There are actually two ways to interpret that, I think. So one is to say that the manipulation, the disgust inducing manipulation, only worked where the participants had this heightened sense of their own body, high private body consciousness. So in that case, the prediction is confirmed, right? It's just that we couldn't actually induce sufficient disgust um, in participants with lower private body consciousness. However, there's another way of interpreting this, which is to say that all the participants will have felt more disgust when watching the disgusting video and less disgust when watching the other videos, but we only saw the effect in the high private body consciousness. So it may be, this is the other possible interpretation, only people with high private body consciousness are influenced by feelings of disgust in making ethical judgments. It may be that people with low private body consciousness are relatively unaffected by their feelings when they make ethical judgments. And in that case, I think we wouldn't want to say that the prediction was confirmed outright. We'd want to say that the prediction actually 
is it false, although there are people, a subset of people, for whom the prediction is likely true. There's more that you could say here as well. So what I would suggest is this. If you've been having a discussion with your lecture buddy where you disagree about whether or not the prediction is confirmed, that's actually very good because there is room for disagreement about whether or not the prediction is confirmed. As philosophers, I think we should take a cautious attitude here. We should take a cautious attitude and we should think there is some evidence that kind of supports the prediction, but we're going to need quite a bit more before we accept that the prediction is supported and therefore before we accept this hypothesis. Now we've got to be careful here. Some people might be thinking that the study is actually evidence against Sinner Armstrong and colleagues, against their hypothesis, and it falsifies the prediction. Why might you think that? Well, mistakenly, you might think that Schnall and colleagues show that for people without high private body consciousness, disgust makes no difference to their moral judgments. But here you have to be super careful. We shouldn't go too far in that direction either. The reason is very simple. Schnall and colleagues did not find evidence that, in experiment four, low private body consciousness participants were influenced by disgust. But to not find evidence of something is not the same as thing as finding evidence that it's not the case. They didn't find evidence that it is the case, but they also didn't find evidence that it's not the case. So we certainly can't say that these findings are actually evidence against Sinner, Armstrong and colleagues' theory. What I'm suggesting to you is that before we really take them to be evidence for the theory, we need to some further findings that provide confirmation for how we should interpret the findings in the first place. And that's very different from saying that this is actually evidence against the theory. One last thing. When you read the chapter by Sinnott, Armstrong and colleagues on moral intuition, you will notice that they take Schnell et al. 2008 to be evidence for their theory. And indeed, I picked this work because I think it's partly uh, it's among the very best pieces of evidence, the strongest pieces of evidence for their theory. But when they discuss that, they don't mention any of the complications that should cause hesitation. So if you read that paper, you might get the impression that, you know, look, there's a whole bunch of evidence that supports their theory and everything is good. When you look more carefully at the details of the experiment, which might be a foreign thing for many people on this course to do, because I don't suppose that a lot of you have studied psychology, when you look at the details of the experiment, you find that the situation is much more complicated than the philosophers tell you. And you will see this again and again. You're going to see that the philosophers' reports of the scientific evidence are, in one way or another, unsatisfactory, often skewed towards their own theories. So we should offer, we should adopt an attitude of untrusting. We should always go back and read the scientific research and take a view ourselves. You're right, I am a philosopher and you shouldn't trust me either. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. I've offered you a presentation of the research as a starting point, but you should take the same attitude to what I'm telling you as you take to any other philosopher. Do not trust. Go and take a look at the scientific research for yourself. Form your own view on this. I have often been wrong about scientific research. <laughs>